Today's lesson is Octavian Plays the Game. War was not declared until more than six months later, but this final struggle for control of the Roman state actually began in the newly named month of July, 44 BC, when Octavian had celebrated the games in Julius Caesar's honor and Antony was consul. It was amazing what changes were to take place in a single year. Just one year and a month later, Octavian would have forced the Senate to give him, a mere boy of 19 years, the position of council, that highest place in the Roman state. Years later, he had forgotten or chose to overlook the fact that he had seized the councilship by force, but the fact remains. These are the events that led up to it. They are so many and took place so rapidly that we have to follow them like moves in a close game of wits. That is what <clears throat> it really was, a cruel, hard game of politics and war, a third-cornered game to begin with between Octavian, Antony, and Caesario, who stood for the Republic. Month by month, move by move, this is what happened in that bitter struggle that followed the death of Julius Caesar. July of, 14, of 44 B.C., Antony looked ahead six months to the end of his term as council, got the Senate to decree that for the following year he should be governor of Cisalpine Gaul. That arranged, he set the next Senate meeting for September 1st. Sextilius, senators were gathered for the meeting. September, Caesario arrived in Rome, but when he found to his disgust on that, the first day, the Senate was to discuss divine rights for Julius Caesar. He sent word that he was too ill from his journey to attend. That infuriated Anthony. Somebody ought to go, he said. Break open his house and drag that, that old man out. That, in turn, made Caesario furious. Next day, dressed in his best toga, he came to the Senate chamber and launched at once upon the first of what was to be the 14th increasingly bitter orientations against Antony. In reply, Antony publicly renounced his friendship with Caesario and all the other traitors and assassins. October. Antony was almost assassinated by Octavia. So he himself declared, Men paid by Octavia to do it, he said, had been caught lurking in his vestibule, and he had barely escaped with his life. With that as an excuse for needing soldiers to protect him, Anthony set out to take command of those legions of Caesars, which were still stations at Brunzelum. Octavia, hearing of this, set out for all for the country south of Rome, there to gather into an army for himself all of Caesar's retired soldiers who might not now had grown bored with farming. November. Octavian was back in Rome with 10,000 men. Marching the Forum, he declared that he and his soldiers were there to defend the people and the Republic against Antony, who had proved to be a traitor. When Antony returned to Rome with his soldiers, the senators, in utter distress, ran back and forth between the two men, urging them to come to terms and not start another war. By this time, poor old Caesario, back home in the country, was also in a dilemma. Every day, he wrote Atticus, I have a letter from Octavian asking me to take up his cause and to be a second time the savior of the Republic and to come to Rome at once. I am afraid to accept and ashamed to refuse. The boy was certainly acting with vigor, vigor yet how could anyone be trusted who bore the name of the tyrant Julius Caesar? What to do? What a mix-up. What a dilemma to be in. December. Anthony had now only one month left of his term as council. He decided not to wait, but set out at once with his cavalry for Cisipine Gaul. To the old governor of the Providence, he sent word to clear out that he, the new governor, was coming. But Decimus, the governor, was the one of the conspirators, forfeited himself in the town of Mutin, Mutinia and refused to move. Thereupon, Antony laid siege to the town in order to starve him out. By this time, Caesario had arrived in Rome and sent word to Decimus to hold fast. Then, sweeping together his worst objectives, he denounced Antony as a monster, a drunken swine, a butte beast, 
brute beast, devoid of all sense and feeling. January. The two councils took office. Cesario, on his feet again, urged them in the Senate to declare war on Antony and to put their trust in Octavian. Cesario was now convinced that the that in this crisis the best thing for the Senate to do was to let Octavian help them defeat Antony and then settle with him later. I pledge my word to you, O Senate, cried Cesario, that Octavian will always be be loyal to the Republic as he is today. To you, to the Roman people, to the state, I pledge my word. The Senate was impressed, enough so to vote Octavian a seat in the Senate, but not enough to declare war on Antony. Not yet not until they had first sent a delegation to confer with him. At the same time, however, they sent Octavian and one of the councils north with armies to scare Antony into reason. The delegation soon returned with the report that Antony was willing to trade his one year in Cisalpine Gaul for five years as governor of Gaul across the Alps. Caesarea was alarmed. Beware, he cried, lest you let this foul and deadly beast escape. And finally, he convinced the Senate that Antony was a dangerous man. February. On the second day, therefore, the Roman Senate formally declared war on Mark Antony. March. The second council was sent north with soldiers to join the other council and Octavian. Moving quickly, Antony tried to prevent their meeting, but ten days later, the three armies of the Senate had joined. Storming Antony's camp, they gained a partial victory, but paid dearly for it with the lives of the two councils, for both of them died that day. Antony, not knowing, of course, that they were dead and Octavian left alone in command, expected that the next day would be bring another attack. So that night, he broke camp and made a hasty escape. Thus, the siege was raised, and Decimus and his soldiers and all four hungry mouths regained their freedom. April. The glad news reached Rome. Wild with joy, the citizens cheered and applauded Caesario. They claimed him in triumph to the capital and acclaimed him for a second time as savior of the state. It was Caesario's great day, the day he had longed to hope for longed and hoped for. No special credit or thanks was given to Octavian by either the state or Caesario for the part that he played, and there they made a fatal mistake. May. Octavian was still in command of the army in Cisalpine Gaul when he received word that he had been voted the barest possible thanks for his part in the victory. Now that he had served his purpose, he saw that he was to be brushed aside by Caesario and the Senate. Very well, he thought. The time had come for him to make a move, and he thought up a shrewd one. The two councils were now both dead, and there were still seven months left to finish out the year. He, Octavian, would demand to be counsel for those remaining months. He was 19 only, much too young. The senators would certainly refuse, but if so, he would use that as an excuse to break off all connection with him. If they appointed him, what could be better? Either way, he was bound to win. June. A delegation of his soldiers went down to Rome to ask the Senate to appoint Octavian counsel. The senators refused. July. The officers went down to Rome again. This time, Octavian went with them. Also a hundred men, against the officer in charge, demanded the appointment for Octavian, and again the senators refused. The men then pointed to his sword. The officer then pointed to his sword. This, said he, will make him counsel if you don't. That was a threat the Senate dared not disregard. Caesario was brokenhearted, utterly overcome with grief, that this boy, whose loyalty to the Republic he had so confidently pledged, had after all followed in his great uncle's footsteps. He had marched on Rome and with a force of arms defied the Roman state. Utterly overcome with grief, the old man, so recently flushed with victory, acknowledged his deceit, defeat and gave up the struggle. <clears throat> Sextilius, on the 19th day of this month, later to be known as August, Octavian was made council of the Roman state. Nervous inside but outwardly calm, he stepped forward from the first time in the customary sacrifices to Jupiter with which the Senate meeting opened. In a circle about him stood the disgruntled senators, each one watching with cold, critical eye for him to fumble. 
To their keen disappointment, he went through the service perfectly. It was likewise to their loss, it seems, that they watched him so intently. For according to the story told years later, when myths had become mixed with history, if they had looked up that day, they would have seen twelve black vultures come swooping down from heaven. Those twelve black vultures of Romulus that had returned again, this time to circle above the head of the young man who was to become Rome's first emperor, the future uh, Augustus Caesar.